pleasure having you back on the morning show, still there, Rise News Channel. It's time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. The pan Yoruba Sociocultural Group of Feniferia and its Niger Delta counterpart, and Niger Delta Forum, PANDEF, has expressed support for the weekend's call by Governor Kairi Faiyami of Ikiti State and Nasir Erufai of Kaduna State for the restructuring of the country. The two groups, however, warned against the call being associated with political coloration. According to Yinka Odumaki, spokesperson for the Feniferia Group, which agrees uh, with anybody who is for state police, which is an ingredient for federalism, but this is no time to choose and pick aspect of federalism and what has, and it has to be awesome. Pandev lauded statements credited to two governors on the need for restructuring of the country, saying that the governors who have spoken have obviously spoken well. Restructuring, calls for restructuring. This has dominated our space for over a month or two now because the conversation before the NSAS protest was restructuring. It was. Yes. And but then it, it, it has to, because you'll recall that in 2015, APC, you know, attained power, as we like to put it here. But for me, public service is a service. It's not about power. But, you know, they won the election based on that platform of change. And a major component of that change was restructuring. It is a, it's a campaign promise. So it, it has to be fulfilled. And those, that party won based on two things. I'm sure you'll agree. One, that promise to restructure Nigeria, uh, amend the constitution. We've all agreed that the 99 constitution really does not serve our current needs as a nation. It just doesn't. Secondly, on the personality or the perceived personality of President Buhari, those were the two selling points. So it is incumbent upon APC to deliver on that very fundamental campaign promise. In um, 2018, they had their committee headed by the governor of um, Kaduna State, Nasser El Rufai, split into groups. They went across the six geopolitical zones of the country. And it would just be such a shame for it to be one more sort of national sort of conference, if you can call it, although it's not officially titled that, that is just relegated to gather dust somewhere. The findings must be made and passed into law because it's past due, isn't it? It's, the 1999 Constitution does not work. We need true federalism at a fiscal level. We need resource control at the state level. We need state police at this point. It's, it's clear. Well, I think first um, the um, call for restructuring should be seen within the context of the call for change. And the latest illustration of that is the NSAS uh, protest that we witnessed in Nigeria over a period of about two weeks. And now we're still dealing uh, with the aftermath. And now, of course, the uh, governor of uh, Ekiti State, Dr. Kaldi Fayemi, chairman of the Nigeria Governors Forum, was invited to um, Kaduna to give uh, a lecture. He was introduced by Governor Nasir Rufai, who is the governor of Kaduna State. And he presented, you know, a lecture in which he raised very key issues about federalism, about restructuring, about the need for development, and strategies that can be adopted. Now, many uh, persons who reacted to that said, well, this was a political move, perhaps because of a comment that was made on that occasion by Nasir Rufai. And they thought that, well, this is an attempt by Nasir Rufai and Kao Defayemi to position themselves for the 2023 presidential process. But I think it is important to look beyond whatever politics uh, may be the subtext and to look at the issues. Mm -hmm. And what is clear, in my view, is that the issue of the calls for restructuring in Nigeria will not go away. People are continually, continuously looking at different aspects of this issue, and they continue to remind the government of the day, and all of us, because the message is not just for the uh, Buhari administration. Because even after the Buhari administration, there will still be talks about restructuring. Exactly. And the, at the heart of the issue of uh, restructuring are questions about the union. Is Nigeria actually a nation? There are issues about inequity. There are issues about justice. There are issues about how do we, in fact, organize this country? and negotiate the union, or if you have to renegotiate it. And there are some extremists who go as far as saying that, in fact, the Nigerian idea is an unworkable idea that should be jettisoned. Of course, if you go to that end, you will then get uh, accused of a treasonable felony, because the Constitution is very clear. It says, yes, you can call for anything, 
but Nigeria remains indissoluble, inviolable, you know, as an entity, as a single entity. But I would like to recommend to um, everyone an engagement with the ideas raised both in the introduction by Nasir Rufai, the governor of Kaduna State, and also the uh, main text uh, that was delivered, which was a very brilliant, well, well I shouldn't patronize Kaud if I may, I mean, he will write well any day. You know, the issues erased, right, as an intellectual, not as a partisan APC person. Tundu, you are absolutely right. Restructuring was one of the major planks of the APC agenda uh, in 2015. Then a committee was set up, uh, Nasir Rufai Committee, to look at it. We were told that uh, President Buhari is committed to restructuring. But I can tell you, every Nigerian president that has been there, go and check their records. Every Nigerian president will tell you that Nigeria will not either be dissolved or decimated under their watch. That's the primary commitment of every president. And I, get, I guess that, I, I, I mean, I don't know what is responsible for that. And that becomes some kind of mental block. If we tell a Nigerian president to restructure Nigeria, he's thinking, no, I don't want it to be in my time. But I think that any president, present or future, even the past ones who are still members of the Council of State, should see that, look, the people are asking for a rearrangement of Nigeria. And that should be a national priority. That national priority does not result in the dismemberment of Nigeria. That's not what it's many people are asking things. for. People are asking for specific things. You refer to state police. You refer to uh, devolution of powers. Uh, uh, you refer to federalism. All of those issues are already codified in existing reports. The most recent being the uh, 2014 National, national Political Conference, Conference Report. Yeah which for partisan reasons, the Buhari administration said they wouldn't even look at it. The government must not resist ideas. There are certain ideas that are out there in the public domain that government must deal with. The American example that we like to re refer to, America evolved constitutionally. It evolved on the basis of what the people wanted. Yeah. Tomorrow, women will be uh, voting in uh, the American election, right? Many years ago, women could not vote. The first woman who tried it was punished for it, for her effrontery. Women died for so the rights the of the society. The suffragette movement. Yes, yes. the, the suffragette suffragette movement. movement. Yes. Yeah. You know, people go to the grave of the woman who left it, you know, to go and paste, I voted. Uh -huh. This is how society is evolved, and Nigeria cannot right, be different. Right, right. Thank you so much. A very valid point. That led to the Federalist Papers in America, you know, rethinking the Constitution. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have the chair of Rotos, Michael, and Adesua to give us updates on global business, COVID-19 pandemic, and Africa reports. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. Still the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. We'll move over to Rotus Odiri now to give us Africa business update. Rotus, good morning. Pleasure talking to you. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, uh, Doctor. So I want to talk about uh, state uh, competitiveness uh, in Nigeria. The senator from Lagos West uh, District, uh, Senator Lamilekon Adiola, uh, and this is actually in our uh, sister publication this day, today's edition of this day. They went on a condolence visit looking at the destruction across Lagos states, and he is seeking a special status for Lagos State in order to assist in the repair of the destruction. So here's what he said, just summary here. From what we saw, it was clear that Lagos cannot handle the rebuilding of infrastructure and facilities destroyed alone as the destruction dwarfed that of other states and the FCT uh, put together. So. He's asking for a special status for the commercial capital of Nigeria that brings in more internally generated revenue than a number of other states combined. If you look at half-year, um, let's look at half-year IGR, internally generated revenue, just a quick summary here. If you take away the FAC allocations, um, which I think Lagos State's FAC allocation was about 50 billion or so, but Lagos brought in 204.5 billion naira uh, in internally generated revenue, was 33% of the half year IGR total. In fact, if you look at the top of the screen there, total IGR for the entire nation for half year or half year 2020 was 612 billion naira. 
The second place state was River State. River State brought in 64 billion naira in IGR. River State FAC allocation was higher than their IGR. I think they brought in uh, 75 billion. Third place um, was the FCT. They had you know, 35 billion IGR, 33 billion in FAC allocations, and then Delta State after that, and then Open State. So, you know, th there's, there's, I'm thinking of a conversation that needs to be had around state competitiveness because you know the question is does should legal states um according to what the senator is requesting here should legal states get that special status 204 billion nigeria they only brought in about 50 billion from fact so legal states is pretty much just able to sustain itself and generate its own revenue but of course it's been said that it's uh, an estimate of about one trillion naira is going to be needed for the states um to to, to fix itself budget was reduced for 2020 to about 920 or so billion naira so th th this is the this is the um conversation that's being put forward the competitiveness of the other states if you look at the amount of destruction that the senator referred to the destruction here dwarfing the rest of the states combined it's almost if you put it in terms of a portfolio an investment portfolio and you think about lagos states as a uh, an asset or a security Nigeria's portfolio of businesses, portfolio of business activity, is heavily weighted, disproportionately weighted in Lagos State to the point to where when you see an anomaly like this, where you have widespread destruction, it dwarfs the other states, and a disproportionate amount of money and status is required for Lagos State to, to bring it back up because the ramifications are going to be heavy when you look at the destruction at the malls and the businesses. Most of these businesses were already underwater as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns. They were hoping that the Christmas period would allow them to maybe make some revenue back. But of course, even the Christmas period is now dependent on the disposable income of everyday Nigerians and how much spending power that, uh, that they have. In fact, the Central Bank of Nigeria in January of this year, they were brought out their consumer, um, consumer survey. People weren't going to be buying big ticket items. They said they weren't going to be buying you know, cars and homes and so on. That was in January before the COVID-19 really hit the nation and we saw the lockdowns and we saw the economic uh, fallout. We're still waiting for third quarter GDP. So the, 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 the point here is, you know, the CEOs, the governors of different states are the CEOs of those states. They have to make an effort to make the other states uh, competitive because at a baseline level, how many people, university graduates coming out of school, how many of them say, oh, I'm going to Benway to go and pursue an opportunity. I'm going to Zamfara. I'm going to Katsina. I'm going to Cross River State. The concentration in Lagos State is so heavy as far as opportunity. At the end of the year, if not for COVID, all the entertainment activities would be uh, concentrated here. Remember, 30 December last year. The stock exchange is here. The, it's the center of you know, financial activity. So if, if you look at the going forward, there has to be some kind of effort from the other states yeah. in order yeah. for them to be more, I, more competitive. I, I mean, I get your drift. Uh, that's what Lagos has always been all these years. The city of Lago de Curamo, let me call it its full name, the lake on the Curamo. But the truth has to be said, we need to be able to make other states viable. And this other states was looking word. So Rotos, after the show, I'll share a report with you that I did with somebody as regards the viability of each state and what resource they have and how they can produce. And I was looking at states like Borno and some other states in the north that had big access that it could produce gum Arabic. And we went one step further to break down the use of gum Arabic. A lot of people drink fizzy drinks. Gum Arabic is a major uh, constituent of fizzy drinks that keep the colors and the preservative and the additive together. A lot of states can churn out this in the north. There is sesame seeds, and they've got land wasting that they can churn out all this product and sell to be able to show up their GDPs. But you need a lot of inventiveness and thinking around this. Across the state, there's a product, and it even needs to go beyond just product under the ground. So two things I'm thinking about, number one, it's intellectual property across the states. Lagos doesn't have to be a hub for technology and for everything. We can decentralize technology hubs to other parts and increase the economy of the state. We can look at IFE, for instance. I don't know why Oshun State has not become a technology hub, because it's got a university. And when you see the way technology grows in, Amer grows in America, the likes of Silicon Valley and the likes, is in California because of Stanford and university communities. So CEOs of the states, which are the governors, have to have a rethink. It's not just about having state investment summits. No, 
We need to have a rethink and a holistic plan on how to make this state viable. Because truly, most states are not viable in this country. That's why they still go in Cappingham to FAC yes. to get resources that are not available. So and, they and, need to do a lot of this. And that's the main issue. Every state uh, in the First Republic, every region, developed according to its own capability. But then Nigeria got overtaken by the cost of oil, the resource cost. Uh, we discovered oil and we all became lazy across Nigeria. Every state in Nigeria today is depending on a resource, on allocation uh, from the federal government. And so every month, they, they all troop to Abuja, federal allocation uh, meeting, cap in hand, to go and collect their own share of the national cake. Mm -hmm. Nigeria needs to move beyond the national cake mentality if the states must become viable. Our states must become centers of productivity rather than centers of uh, collection from yes. the uh, center. That's one point with regard to the viability. As to the issue of Lagos, I think it goes beyond the answers, protests, the devastation that we have seen. The issue of special status for Lagos has been there almost forever. As recently as 2016, uh, Senator Oluru Remi Tinubu, representing Lagos Central, uh, put a bill before the National Assembly. It ended up in a riotous manner. It was rejected. She was asking for a special status for Lagos. And she wanted also a special grant for Lagos, 1% of federal revenue to address the challenges, special challenges faced by Lagos. Now, two weeks ago, Southwest senators, after the NSAS uh, protests, uh, also stood before the National Assembly and said, with the level of devastation we have seen in Lagos, Lagos deserves special status, special support. The latest is what you referred to, uh, Senator Adeola, uh, Solomon Adeola, also known as Yayi, uh, representing Lagos West. So the issue has been there, but it's always been resisted. But the argument is that, look, Lagos is so strategic. About 65% of GDP, of financial you know, uh, hub, located in Lagos. All major federal presences in Lagos, including the ports, the right. two major ports in Nigeria. Exactly. Now, uh, all kinds of federal infrastructure abandoned after the federal capital was moved from uh, Lagos to Abuja. There is a Ministry of Federal Capital Territory. Those pushing a special status for Lagos say 60 years ago, there was, in fact, a Ministry of Lagos Affairs yeah. that was led by Alaji Musa Yaradua. Yes. And they are saying that with present realities, with Lagos as the mega city of Nigeria, with over 20 million people, with a population growth at the rate of about 8% per annum, almost every family in Nigeria has one uh, representative, an ambassador in, in Lagos. Lagos. Oh, and yeah. they are coming in every day. Oh, Six over 60,000 of them day. on a daily yeah. basis. Yes. So these are the issues. So it's a conversation that we can have, and I think it's a legitimate conversation. Because in other countries, Brazil, Malaysia, and elsewhere, Germany, they don't abandon their former capitals. Yes. So the question is, how do we strategize and reposition Lagos that is at the heart of the Nigerian economy? I mean, valid conversations. I would like to say a big thank you to you, Rotus. So you. Moving on to business update with Michael Wilson joining us from London. Michael, it's a pleasure talking to you. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, China continues to uh, outperform. It's a bastion, really, of calm in this very uncertain world. A, a nervous opening, but Chinese manufacturing PMI outperformed, coming in at uh, 53.6 versus 53, as expected. Um, doesn't sound a huge amount of difference, but it's in very, very positive territory. Uh, and, and similarly, um, Asian economies close by are also... Um, uh, Quite, quite expansionary, with the exception of Japan at the moment, uh, and also Malaysia, that fell slightly. Um, uh, possibly uh, a big announcement from their central bank um, maybe uh, this week, and uh, their budget obviously has to, um, well, I say obviously, it has to pass uh, its, its parliament on, on Friday. Um, Ant Financials, we talked about that um, last week, they start trading uh, this week. Uh, over $3 trillion worth of uh, orders were placed for Ant Financial. Um, I don't think uh, that investors are going to actually get many shares, quite honestly. It was hugely um, oversubscribed. But actually, investors perhaps will be thankful of that because they won't be um, subject necessarily to the kind of volatility, which I'm pretty sure we will see um, right through every sector this week. Last, the US sector 
big sell-off on Friday, obviously, because of uh, the, the news of lockdowns and so on, and uncertainty in front of the election, which will dominate the week. Apple, Amazon, Facebook and Alphabet. I mean, they had, as I said to you, some quite good quarterly updates, but um, th there was no uh, guidance from Apple. Facebook uh, talked about lower growth in, in, in North America. Um, the scale of the declines uh, was quite large, actually, and it's been talk of a, you know, a long time that these companies perhaps are slightly having uh, highly lofty um, valuations and maybe those will come home to roost. Um, as far as UK and Euro stocks are concerned, down in the red yesterday, lockdowns and so on. Last week it was announced that Germany and France would have lockdowns. Um, it's getting worse. England, now we go into a lockdown for a month uh, and the furlough scheme has been slightly uh, extended, but uh, not, not, not a lot, obviously. And uh, people, although it's slightly better for employers in as much as they are getting now, uh, they're getting government support for 80 percent of their employees salaries rather than 20 percent less than that. They'll still have to pay pension insurance. But um, it's it's likely that economic uh, activity is going to dip. I mean, what else do you expect? Double dip recession, very, very possibly indeed. Um, and, and also, no, although a date's been sort of put on this lockdown finishing, which is December the 4th, um, whether it will or not, the government was uh, very, very... Um, well, the Prime Minister, at least, was very fuzzy about that kind of advice. Uh, commodities then, oil are really hitting the canvas once again. Um, but uh, uh, precious metals actually doing slightly better. I think that's down to the f very, very simple matter of the fact that people are slightly at risk, uh, risk, risk averse and therefore... Um, you know, you're going, you're going to see investment in in those, but oil um, still we're getting right down on the right down on the canvas really because of demand and so on. We took, again talked about that on Friday. So U.S. elections will dominate the week. Um, it's looking like a Republican se Senate would be the the, the better thing for the um, equity markets. No huge amount of taxes, no huge amount of. Uh, um, um, fiscal stimulus, uh, but we'll see. The week ahead, all right, so election, US election aside, it's a busy one. Um, Royal Bank of Australia, FOMC, Bank of England, all these big central banks meeting. Of course, we have the all-important uh, jobs figures from the United States on Friday. Um, I don't think you're going to see much of a change in interest rates, but certainly we'll be looking at all these announcements to see whether the central banks are going to help. Whether you think central banks ought to be helping in the same way that they are, and whether it should be down to governments to actually finding their way through this thicket of information, well, that's a big debate, actually. But uh, the, the, central, the central banks at the moment um, are, are trying to help. And also, we get more information out of China. So it's going to be a very busy week as far as the... Um, the big, the big data is concerned. That's your global view this morning. Okay, Michael, quickly, I, I want to talk about the fact now that the furlough scheme now has to be extended till December because of the lockdown. That's more money printing. That's more, probably if you want to call it helicopter money, that's more inflation on the British economy. Make us understand what is happening. Well, the the the, the bank will. Uh, I mean, this uh, the, the furlough scheme is, which is from the Treasury rather than the Bank of England. Um, yes, of course, it's printing money, but interest rates are quite low at the moment. I'm not making excuses for it, and and the and the fact of it is, it does finish. So we're just going to have the same kind of problems in a month's time that we actually have now. But that that was about the only silver lining to the a very gloomy announcement on Saturday uh, from the Prime Minister about about what was going to happen. Um, I I think that. Uh, uh, very many small businesses will fall through the cracks. As far as is concerned, there is very little support um, for um, those uh, those uh, supply uh, companies to the service industries, which are going to suffer hugely. Pubs and restaurants will close. So the only there'll be there'll be essential manufacturing, building, and things like that that will that will continue. But as far as the service sector, as far as human facing um, industries are concerned, there'll be very little activity for a month. So I think it's going to be very very difficult indeed. It's it's a temporary bandage, if you like, to, uh, um, to to the system. It's slightly better for employers, as I said, because they're getting slightly more support. But anybody looking at this would be crazy to think this is going to be this is going to ameliorate, which is going to be a very very tough time for the UK economy and indeed for Euro economies and for economies around the world. Well, uh, Michael, first I would like to ask you: Are you preparing for the uh, uh, national lockdown that the Prime Minister has announced, and which will take effect from? Uh, 
uh, Thursday, but that's at the personal level. Now, businesses, yeah. uh, the Council of British uh, Industry is asking for more support, uh, uh, financial support for businesses. Would that happen? Would Rishi Sunak consider that? Now, you talked about the United States, the possibility of uh, the uh, Republicans taking the Senate. But I've also seen some analysis indicating that the Democrats may well end up seizing control of the entire Congress. Were that to happen, what would be the implications? And how are the markets responding to the U.S. election and also to the fact that in Europe, uh, almost half of Europe is uh, locking down nationally? Which would you like first? Let's do the United States. Just say them one after the other. <laughs> we'll talk, talk, talk about the United States, first of all. Um, I think, uh, yeah, look, it, the, the fact is that now 80 million of the United States have actually um, uh, have actually voted postally. Um, and I was talking to a betting company earlier this morning, and the bets are in this country that Joe Biden will actually win. But there will still be a struggle for the Senate. And as I was saying earlier, that will be very, very complicated indeed. I think most people would actually like a result rather than the ongoing um, discussions that are not, I would have almost definitely uh, going to take place. So I think we're a long way from making any views oh, about oh, what business oh. will, actually, will actually get out of this, to be honest. Um, as far as Europe and the UK is concerned, it's going to be a horrible, horrible autumn and a, n not a very nice winter, quite honestly. Personally, we wash our hands. <laughs> we, we stay away from people. That's what we do. And probably you stock up on food as you prepare for the lockdown, Marcel. Well, Thank you so much. Uh, really no, appreciate it. OK, really appreciate no, you. I'll, I'll, we'll just, 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 we, ha we have been told that we should not be besieging the supermarkets because okay. they will be open. So nobody's okay. panic buying right now. But we've got some baked beans in if it makes you happy. OK, that's great. For good measure. Anyway, uh, for updates on COVID-19 pandemic, I just want more of joins us. Good morning, guys. It can be as simple as that. Wash your hands, stay away from people as much as you can. Good morning, Rufai, Dr. Bhatti, and Chundum. Morning. Well, let's look at the latest numbers from the coronavirus pandemic globally. According to the tally by the Johns Hopkins University, over 46 million people have now been affected. The United States remains the most affected country with over 9.2 million confirmed cases. And there has now been over 1.2 million deaths uh, due to the coronavirus globally. Uh, this comes as the head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, via a tweet uh, confirmed that he is self-isolating. If we can get the tweet of the WHO chief, uh, Dr. Ghebreyesus said uh, he has recently been in contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19 uh, he says he's also not suffering any symptoms and would continue to work from home. We also use the opportunity to tell people that we need to work together. We need to pull together to end the pandemic. Uh, so you see that uh, there is no limit to who uh, can or might be affected uh, by the coronavirus pandemic. Now, talking about the U.S. that has the uh, largest infection rate, uh, as the country counts down to election day, we are probably in the hours now, uh, same cannot be said of the coronavirus pandemic in the country. Uh, the country recorded over 74,000 new infections yesterday and also surpassed the 230 deaths mark. Um, this is as Dr. Fauci, America's leading infectious disease expert, uh, says the U.S. is in for a whole lot of hurt. Dr. Fauci, that's not Dr. Fauci playing. That's uh, right. <laughs> uh, well, uh, and uh, he gave a bleak appraisal of the uh, Trump administration's handling of the coronavirus uh, pandemic in an interview. And that has drawn quite a sharp rebuke from the White House. They say, once again, it's about the sixth time I've heard this, that Dr. Fauci is politicizing the pandemic. He's a politician. They say he's trying to give Biden a lead in, in the race. Uh, Dr. Fauci had said that the two leading candidates are looking at the, the pandemic differently. He says President Trump is trying to reopen the country, looking at it in ec economic uh, realities on ground. But he says that Biden, on the other hand, is looking at the health and uh, scientific perspective of the pandemic. And when it comes to coronavirus, I think we should follow the science. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, away from the United States, let's turn to the Middle East worst hit country, and that would be Iran. 
News coming out from Iran suggests that the death toll we are recording may not be the true picture. Uh, that's according to the head of Iran's medical council, Mohammad Reza Zavagandi. Mr. Zavagandi says that the actual death toll in Iran may actually be triple the number of the recorded deaths in the country. And yesterday, official figures in Iran for deaths stood at uh, 35,298. Now, if you do the maths, uh, triple of that, you have an idea of what Mr. Safagandi is talking about. Uh, Iran has also reported 620,491 infections. Um, in Spain, workers at funeral homes across the country took part in a strike yesterday demanding that more staff be employed as COVID-19 deaths continue to rise. Uh, the strike came on a day called All Saints Day or the Day of the Dead. Uh, that's when people visit the tombs of their loved ones. The All Saints uh, Day. The All Saints Day, yes. It's also the, the, called the Day of the Dead. Now, Spain has recorded more than 1 million cases, 1.1 million cases, and 35,800 deaths. Uh, during the first wave of the pandemic in March, what we saw in Spain was that a lot of barriers were postponed, they were delayed, uh, cremation sometimes took place uh, thousands of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers away uh, as funeral homes struggled with the demand. Meanwhile, protesters in several Spanish cities have clashed with security forces over new coronavirus restrictions in the country. The biggest disturbance over the weekend uh, came in from Madrid, where scores of demonstrators set up barricades set bins alight and chanted freedom. It's something we're seeing across Europe as those new restrictions are coming into place. Uh, there's a pushback from the people or politicians not agreeing on what exactly to do with the new lockdown measures. And finally, guys, mass testing doesn't get any bigger than this. What is going on in Slovakia is something every country should be paying attention to. And now the country has said it is going to test its entire uh, about 5.5 million population. And what they did over the weekend in one day testing, they tested half of that. Uh, they tested about 2.5 uh, 2.5 to 2.8 million people in the country. And as a result, 1% of that number came back positive, and they are now going to go into uh, lockdown. Now, uh, some may say this is not really voluntary because those who don't take part in this testing would have to pay fines and would be put in compulsory uh, uh, lockdown, uh, and including not going to work. Now, it has also received some backlash because some experts say the antigen test being used in Slovakia is not as accurate as the PCR test. But again, how do you understand the extent of the virus if you do not test? So on the one hand, Slovakia needs to be watched by other countries. This might just be what we need to test everybody and understand what is going on. But on the other hand, what is the efficacy of the test we're doing? That's a really great question, because what I read is that those antigen tests return a 30% false negative outcome, which is pretty poor. But on the positive side, it's really impressive, like you said, this huge logistical operation that Slovakia has managed to carry out to be yes. concluded this weekend. Yes. Everybody, the whole population, apart from children under the age of 10, that is impressive by any way you choose to look at it. As for Dr. Fauci, I wonder what he makes of the chance that President Trump's um, campaign rally, fire Fauci. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of the locker up from the Hillary Clinton days. It's really <laughs> most unfortunate. If Donald Trump wins, it's looking like he will be fired. Because a few weeks ago, you recall that he took great umbrage publicly at being misquoted during a campaign advert for President Trump. And he said he has never publicly endorsed a candidate. But this latest interview that he has done is pretty much an endorsement of Joe Biden. So he did try. He said he prided himself on staying above the fray throughout his entire career. But he appears to have taken a side now, which might not be the wisest move in case the incumbent cannot be beaten, which is likely. And as for Spain and the um, strikes, that is natural, and it's not surprising to anybody. The Spanish funeral workers are overwhelmed and overstretched, mm -hmm. and it just goes to show the gravity of what we're facing. You'll recall that in the UK, when Prime Minister Boris Johnson did everything he could, including the rather confusing tier system, anything mm -hmm. to avoid a national lockdown, what appears to have swayed him was the report that the UK would also face difficulties with funeral homes, they would have to use ice rings to store, you know, the bodies of the deceased. Really quite grim. So that's what forced him to have this um, 
about fast on this um, lockdown problem. It's really scary. Coronavirus right. is very, awful. Very, very scary, scary one. And valid points raised about Slovenia. In fact, China led the way as regards that. China tested an entire city of 4.3 million people. Uh, concerning people talking about human rights, coronavirus is a war zone. During a war, there's something called a draft. Mm. You are pulled into a draft. If you don't turn up for the draft, you're called a draft dodger, which is against the law. Please let us see coronavirus as a war. So taking the test. You go to jail for being a draft Yeah, you go to judge. jail for being a draft mm -hmm. well, Let's see, clear. not taking the test we're, for coronavirus. We're talking about Europe. Europe faces a long winter ahead. A nasty one. With all the uh, national lockdowns that we're witnessing. But what are we doing in Nigeria? Mm -hmm. In response to the warning by the African Center for Disease Control, that Africa faces a second wave. Yes. And that is where the problem is. Because here in Nigeria, everybody seems to have relaxed completely. Mm -hmm. And mm. that in itself is uh, very unfortunate.